I broke them up into uh, categories as I'm apt to do. So we're gonna start with growth, kind of growth or marketing. Uh, we have seven in product, five in productivity, um, which are kind of the fun ones, and then eight in operations, internal ops of the business. What's funny, I've never done a talk like this. And I was joking with Xander, this is my listicle talk, right? Because it's like 31 things to change your business. I had an idea for this um, a couple years ago, probably five or six years ago. I sketched some things out and I, I came up with like 15 or 20 like things you could throw out. And I was gonna do it almost as like an attendee talk at some, at microconf. Before I get started, as I always do, I enjoy, I'm really glad that I am not the first speaker to bring on some pictures of my why, of my family. Because every time at microconf, I do it. And these are the peeps, right? This is Finn and Fisher. Many of you have seen since this guy would carry in to a microconf, like, you know, on, on a baby Bjorn or whatever. Um, the dog is the new addition. Uh, but I appreciated, um, you know, the, the from Dawn earlier today, because this is always, I like to level set this. Like, if you've heard me on Startups for the Rest of Us, I refer to freedom, purpose, and relationships. And the relationship part, this is where it starts for me, right? And this is why I've done entrepreneurship. This is why I've done what I've done. So I just want to remind folks to, to be thinking about that for yourself and not sacrifice it. Okay, so let's dive in. So growth. And I was going to say how many are in here, but I don't remember. 11, 15? Anyways, we'll get in it. So the first one is to qualify and route demos automatically. Qualify and route demo requests automatically. So here's a homepage, and this is a tiny seed company that does re-commerce, and they added the book a demo buttons, right, as a lot of us do. The moment you add book a demo, you start getting a bunch of demo requests, hopefully. The moment you get a bunch of demo requests, you find out a bunch of those demo requests are people that really aren't qualified, and they're people that maybe you're only gonna pay you $20 a month or $30 a month. So we ran into this at Drip, specifically. We, were, we had so much inbound, which is a good problem to have, but it's still a problem when you're getting seven demos booked per day and you're the only person doing it. So what we did was uh, put a little snippet of JavaScript, and this is the form they have today. I'll be honest, ours was much simpler. I think ours was first name and email and, and subscriber count. Basically, we have a value metric, right? It's more subscribers, more money. So you gotta figure out what is your single, maybe two qualifying questions? If it's seats, how many seats are you gonna use? If it's contacts, how many contacts do you have? If it's subscribers, how many do you have? Um, and that's what you're really trying to do. And our, there's a competitor of ours that has done a, a similar thing. This is not an uncommon thing to do, okay? But the, the cool part and the thing that we had never seen done when we implemented this is that then we decided, so our base plan was 50 bucks a month. And in the early days, we wanted to demo everybody because we were learning, it was customer development. By the time you hit 10, 20, 30K, only worth demoing to $99 a month and up, right? So with a quick snippet of JavaScript, we were able to say, are they qualified? Our current definition of qualified is they'll pay us at least 49 or 99 a month, but we can just change that with a line of JavaScript at any time. If they're qualified, we would say, great, and we'd send them straight to our then it was Calendly, and now it's a Savvy Cal link. But we sent them straight to our booking link, right? And if they were not qualified, we sent them straight to a video demo of me. They still got a demo, and it started with, hey, I'm Rob Balling, I'm the founder of Drip, co-founder of Drip, sorry, Derek. Um, I'm the co-founder of Drip, and um, this is my quick, you know, it's a quick demo, I'm gonna walk through some features, it was like 10 or 12 minutes. So they still got a demo, I didn't like, oh, you free trial, like they didn't think that they got, you know, short shrifted, so to speak. Um, and then over time, you know, you hit 50K a month and it's like, well, we're only gonna talk to 199 a month and up. And then we hit, and then we hired a new salesperson. It's like, well, we have a bunch of bandwidth, so we back it off to 99, right? And then it was like, before long, it was three, four, five hundred $500 a month in order to, to do a demo. So this is a nice thing to implement. Definitely can do it in under an hour. And I uh, hope that one's helpful. Number two, monitor your sending IPs and domains. <sighs> I ran an ESP. And so many things go wrong with email sending. Um, so many that I vowed to never start a, a startup that ever sent email ever again. And I joked that I, my password resets would from here on be via SMS because I so hated email. But the, the trouble is blacklists happen for reasons that may or may not be your fault. But the problem is, is even if you use third party, let's say you're using Mailgun, Mandrel, Postmark, SendGrid, any of these you know, API layers that you can uh, send emails, some of those we found didn't monitor th their own IPs. 
So we would be sending through them, we had dedicated IPs, and it would ping, this is MX Toolbox is a tool we used. MX Toolbox would ping us and say, you're on blacklist. And we'd go ask this provider and they would say, yeah, it's not your fault, it was someone else. And it's like, but why didn't you fix this? Like we notified them. So um, it's pretty easy for your IPs, whether you're sending through yourself or through a third party API to get on uh, a blacklist. And once they do, your deliverability goes to shit and your open rates go in the tank. So MX Toolbox is a tool we use. There may be a better one now, but I swear it was 10, 20 bucks. It was almost not a non-existent cost. The other thing is you have IP addresses, which you can usually, if you have a SendGrid account or whatever, you can just go see which IPs are being sent through. But you also have a domain, sending domain, micrograph.com, tinyc.com. That you should also be tracking on an ongoing basis, I think. Um, because frankly, given how many emails we all send and how critical this is, if you're not getting you know, the equivalent of a Google alert when you're, when you're uh, blacklisted, it's a problem. And it's really, this is 100% doable in like 20 or 30 minutes. The hardest part's gonna be where, which domains are we using to send? Uh, I'm sorry, not which domains. Which IPs are we using to send? That's gonna be the hardest part. Otherwise, sending, setting it up is not a big deal. Third tip, uh, encourage annual upgrades at the right time. So a lot of us, um, we like annual plans as, as founders. Some, some do, some don't. But annual plans give us a lot of cash up front, gives us a quick payback on ad spend. Um, and many of us, this is Castos pricing page just as an example. So many of us at sign up say, you can choose, self-select, pay monthly, you pay annual, and you get a discount. Uh, usually it's like 10 months for the price of 12. No, 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 it's the other way. 12 months for the price of 10. And that's cool. And some certain percentage will self-select in, depending on your audience, 10%, 20%. And then either people never pitch again your annual plan, or they pitch it at the wrong time. And what we found was the best time, and I've seen a few other uh, companies do this as well, the best time involves churn and tracking churn. So I'm gonna show you this image. When I Googled, um, because I don't really have like access, easy access to a churn graph anyway, any, anymore. So I Googled like uh, churn graph, churn image. Every single one is like this. And at the bottom, if you can't see it, it says revenue churn 10%. And it's just a, it's just a smooth graph that's like 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, right? Well, that's not how churn goes if you've ever run an app. I mean, it's much, much, much more. This is a real churn graph. Usually, you lose a lot early on. 30, 60, 90, that's the usual range. Um, the SaaS, app, SaaS apps I've run have had tremendous, had the highest churn uh, between um, uh, zero and 60 or zero and 90 days, and then it flattens out, right? And that's essentially what this does, although this one goes almost out six months before it hits the 4% the four mark, um, which still feels a little high to me, but Anyways, you can see that if you're pitching, let's say you're in the app, you've converted to paid, this is month one, and you um, send them an email, an automated email that says, hey, you should uh, upgrade annual. Well, you're still churning out 8% of people in month one-ish, and then 6%, and then 5%, like, everybody's not onboarded yet, right? Are people mentally committed yet? So really what we saw, and again, our graph was different, um, last three SaaS apps I had, they all were in the 60, 90 day window. So what we would find is when did the churn, when did the churn really start flattening out? And in fact, if you don't, if you, if churn never flattens out for you, that's actually like a non-viable business long-term because you eventually, it means you just churn everyone out uh, all the time. So find where it starts to plateau. In this case, it would be about six months, I'd say. Um, and this is when I would be pitching annual because you know people are churn out at such a tremendously low uh, uh, percentage at this point. And this is like the email text I said. Um, that we would put it in an automated email that went out, again for us it was 60 days, so then it was about within a month of that point, so it was 60 to 90 days. Some point they would get an email and it was this, it's like, hey, first name, I wanna let you know about a way to get two months free. If you upgrade, you'll get blah, blah, blah. It only takes a click, you can find out more and upgrade here, warmly Rob Founder. It was something like that. Um, and you can feel free to swipe this and edit it, you know, but it's just a very simple, I always sign stuff as the founder, and um, we had good, you know, much better uptake on this than trying to pitch it at any other, any other time. All right, number four, help yourself by helping a B2B writer. If you're doing any type of content marketing or link building, you may have used Harrow, which is help a reporter out. That's an interesting service. 
and it takes a lot of work um, to monitor. You get a ton of, you get two or three emails a day. Each email has a list of like reporters or press or even just like bloggers, content marketers who are looking to, to get an answer to a question like, hey, I'm doing a roundup of the best marketing approaches in you know, B2C to B to C SaaS today. And you respond and, and maybe get a link. Harrow is cool and it's very big and it um, takes a lot of work. I have submitted personally probably over the course of several years, and I, I used to pay a little agency called Bite Size PR to do it for me too. I've probably submitted 50 pitches to Harrow, and I think I've gotten three or four like, links. So, it, you know, there's, it's just a high signal to noise uh, uh, type of thing, I, or high noise to signal, I think, for them. There's a new service that has just come out in the last year, and it's called Help a B2B Writer. And so it's a much more of a bunch of folks like us in MicroConf. And in fact, I noticed that like, the domains come through, I'm like, there was like a Shopify article like a month ago. There was, um, there's some other kind of, again, B2B SaaS startups that have come out. So I signed up for this just to be curious. I'm not even really looking for links or anything, but I get, you, and you say, you know, there's SaaS, there's marketing, um, the categories. There is e-commerce, there's a few others, and it, you can tell it's someone kind of in our sphere more, and it's lower traffic. Um, but I've submitted three, and I think I got two links already. And so, you know, maybe this gets bigger, as big as Harrow someday, and, it, and then it doesn't work anymore. But for now, it's a pretty cool service. Um, I get two emails a day, and they usually have one or two pitches, and they're usually a good, have been a good fit for me. So this is just an example. Looking for SaaS business software buyers to share their experience and purchasing software for the company. They should talk to April. She has a great analogy for that. You should send the toilet analogy to them. Alternative.co. So anyways, yeah, that's just a fun, again, it's a fun little tip that subscribing to that takes you less than 60 minutes, I guarantee it. All right, number five is to consider a Google Analytics alternative. So I, when I look ahead three, five years, I don't know if Google Analytics is still gonna be legal in Europe and who the heck knows what, what else is coming. Google is still GDPR compliant technically until it's, but not by the Austrian government. So they're like, nope, Google Analytics constitutes a violation of GDPR and it is possible that more European authorities will soon follow. So this is an article from, I don't know, it's the past few months. To me, if I'm hedging my bets, I'm signing up for a backup platform and I'm installing tracking code now. So I have history in two platforms. It's less than 60 minutes. Um, the plat for, there's a couple platforms. I actually asked in the Tiny Seed Slack to find out what, it, what is everybody using today for not using Google Analytics. I remember 10 years ago it was Clicky, getclicky.com. They were the only alternative, but they're a little, you know, they're a little longer in the tooth, I would say, than, than maybe you want to use. Um, but Fathom, many of you know the founders of Fathom. They have a, a fun podcast, and they're in the bootstrapper, um, you know, kind of microconf-related uh, crowd. So Fathom's a good one and certainly reasonably priced. Um, they also have uptime monitoring built in, which is another tip that I have later. And then uh, heap.io heap is, is the other one people said. There's, there's several when you Google for it, but these are the kind of two I think that personally I'd probably use Fathom, but I would, I would at least compare uh, the two. And again, am I saying uninstall Google Analytics today and run away? Not, not particularly, but I do think having um, redundancy in a lot of these areas I think can be helpful. Tip number six, and this, is, this one is just so clever and so simple to do. It's to yourdomain.com slash meeting. Redirect that to your scheduling link. Use Calendly, Savvy Cal. I got this from uh, a founder, uh, Andy Cabasso of Postaga. You can see it at the bottom. And I needed a slide with visuals, so I went and I, HT Access is the top one. I was like breaking out my HT Access Linux stuff. Second one is, um, what is that, Squarespace, and the third one's WP Engine. That's how you do it. But if, if you have Linux, the top one, is how you would redirect your, that would be your meeting link to my meeting URL. You wanna do that? I'll suddenly have a bunch of calendar invites. I'll be like, hey, I can do a demo of stuff. Um, that's not my real meeting URL either. That would be dumb. So, oh, and it's a, it's a 302, by the way, not a 301 because it is not permanent, right? You wanna be, we want it to check back. You want browsers to check back. So, simple, two slides, but that was when I was like, I need to do this. That's kinda cool. Number seven is to keep a marketing change log. And this is something I don't remember if we heard about this or if we came up with this idea, honestly. 
but we all know what a change log is in, uh, you know, for your code where you can see the commits and the labels and the branches and the stuff you've done over the past X months. You can go back through it. Yeah, we changed this. Oh, this broke. Well, why did it break? Well, because we have a change log. So we were having trials one month and suddenly we didn't have any more trials. And we said, what broke? And we said, we don't know. We don't have a marketing change log. So we implemented one and it's a Google sheet. And this, I literally, I went into my Google Docs account and I searched for marketing change log. That is the real marketing change log from Drip before we got acquired, it, it ends in April. You can see like real names in here, Anna, right? Many of you know her as customer success. And all it is, is it's a date, it's what we did, and then we categorize stuff in case we wanna look for it. And this is all manual, it didn't pull from anything, but we, more than once we referred back and we were like, well, why did, why did this number change? Because, oh, and I just, I noticed this right before, Look at uh, num uh, number three. It's 1110, November 10th of 2015. Added subscriber count drop down to request a demo. That was, we literally added, ah, oh, that's cool. It, was, it all ties together. So anyways, marketing change log, I recommend it. I mean, honestly, I think everyone should do this. Getting one started is certainly less than an hour. Maintaining it, maybe a little more discipline, right? You need some type of process and, and to let a team know when you do stuff. Split tests, this would be if I added or removed credit card, this would be if I made major changes to any type of marketing campaign, rolled out a new one, pulled one back, because attribution is hard these days, we know that, and this is a way to at least have some dates and have some, uh, you know, some info. Number eight, simple one, most people know Google Alerts. You want your, probably your name, you want your company name, your product name, probably some competitors that you're monitoring. Monitoring, Google Alerts are delayed 12 hours, 24 hours, even if you, they're not instant, because it's crawling the web and stuff. But I still have all that. And F5Bot, which is this free tool that is super fast crawler of Reddit and Hacker News and this thing called Lobsters, which I've never even heard of. But Reddit and Hacker News is what I use it for. And so now I'm getting, um, you know, I have Startups for the Rest of Us, Migrant of Tiny Seed, I have my book titles, I have my name. Just in case something gets mentioned in a Hacker News thread, I can pop in and be like, hey, thanks for the mention. Yeah, actually. And I can clarify or I can say I'm working on an updated version of that book for the 10th year in a row. Um, but F5Bot is free and I don't know, I've been using it for eight months. This is, look at this amazing email they send me. Isn't that some great UX? But I mean, I can't even read that, but you know, there's a blue line that says Reddit comment. I click on that on my phone. It gets me into Reddit and I'm like, oh cool. Someone just, what did they mention here? Startups for the rest of us? Yeah. And so I was like, hey, thanks. You, oh, it's this specific episode, right? They just mentioned a, a, the podcast itself and I went and Googled the episode and brought it into the thread. So it was like just being helpful on the internet. So that's a cool little tool. Number nine is a fun little exercise if you've never done it. We often look at churn, and I, you should never look at one churn number. My churn is 7%. That, don't tell me that, okay? At number one, it should be revenue churn. Customer churn is secondary. But number two, date-based, because your churn before 60, 90 days is high, and then it goes down low, so tell me about those. And then the next fun adventure is to segment your churn by pr a price point. And you could pick tier, you could do it by tiers, or you could just make an arbitrary call and be like, well, all the tiers below 50, we think churn higher, so let's, let's just do that. So there's this tweet I sent that unfortunately I accidentally deleted um, since then. For more than a decade, I've been saying low, uh, lower paying customers churn faster. Here's another data point. It's from a tiny seed company. It's anonymized, but it's used with permission. So segment A, which we're about to see the numbers on, segment A is the, lo the less expensive, right? 29 bucks a month and under. Segment B, $99 a month and up. So, all right, enormous difference in churn and uh, net churn and LTV. So this is it. Segment A, who pays less than 29, churned at 11%. Segment B, who pays 99 and up, churns at minus 4%. So net negative churn, which is 15% churn swing, which is, you know, catastrophic or, or the opposite of catastrophic if, if you're on the, the plus side of that. Um, you know, in trying to grow a company with 11% net churn versus minus 4%, if that was your whole business, is just night and day. It can mean the difference of having a quarter million dollars versus a million in ARR or more. The reason I'm saying to do this is to, you, maybe you can do it with a SQL query. Maybe you do it, at, you ex export from Stripe and you literally do it in a Google Sheet just once just to see what it's like statically. It's not gonna change dramatically. It's not gonna be 100% higher, 50% lower next month. You have an idea of it, do it every few months. 
it just gives you insights into who your best customers are. I mean, the lifetime value difference, think of this, like even if, if it wasn't 99 and up, if it was 29 and 99 points, and then you do the churn, the lifetime values on those things are like, poof, like you can spend so much more money. So it gives you insight into things, like that your lower plans probably aren't that helpful. Here's the caveat I'm gonna say, because then my next point is to consider dropping your lowest plan. Just because your churn is high on your lowest plan does not mean you should drop your lowest plan. Because sometimes your lowest plan, you're capturing the market. They don't go to competitors when, you know, at the lower price points, and especially if they feed an auto upgrade into your $99 plans. But if there's not a lot of upgrading happening, that's when you think, do I just have two products? I have an expensive product that's 99 bucks with great churn, and I have a kind of a product that everyone churns out of and is $29 and no one's upgrading? That's, to me, the signal to think. Maybe I should just hide this plan and see what happens. So it's not a direct uh, absolute yes, you should do it, but it is something that is fun to know and good to know as you allocate resources to different types of customers. We actually pumped in when we used Help Scout. We had a custom bar on the side, a custom widget, and we would pull in what plan people were on, how long, like what they had paid us to date, how many support requests, all this stuff such, such that we could, I don't remember doing this, but if we could have like had a priority support tier where basically if you pay us more, we respond quicker. Um, but I don't remember necessarily doing that. So as I said, number 10 is drop your lowest plan. Can think about dropping your lowest plan with the caveat that I said earlier. Um, of course, we know that the first order effect dropping your lowest plan is it should, it should increase your average revenue per user. Um, and then I have these fancy graphs of these three companies that I, uh, advise that like all they did was incre they increased their prices and you know the, the graphs went up um, and these are legit like actual graphs. So the hard part, the hard part about increasing prices is there's a lot of hard parts and I did a 50 minute talk on this at MicroConf Europe. That talk's going to be out soon whenever we get it uh, launched and all I talk about is like how to think through pricing changes, how whether to, to, you know, grandfather or not, um, and then how to communicate it if you're going to do it, how much to raise, value metrics, all this stuff. So it's a whole talk unto itself. And in that talk, I have this, you know, this tip, and I say, if, you, if you're just scared to do all that, for a week, just hide your lowest pricing plan and see what happens. Just play with it. Do, do your signups just go away, or... Do half your signups from 999 plan go away, but the other half go to 49.99 because suddenly that's a very different business that you're running. Right? So it's just it, this is the easiest, simplest. When I you can't raise prices in under an hour. There's too many things. You could hide this on your pricing page in less than an hour and see. You then need to monitor it over the course of a week or two, though. All right, that was number ten. Number eleven is to make an ask after a successful support ticket. But yeah, so. Uh, you can ask for a testimonial, or you can ask for like a, a review in Captera if you guys are a G2 crowd or one of these things. And the idea is if someone, great support, you know, you, you've done it, you respond, and someone's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you implemented that feature so fast. Oh my gosh, that was an amazing experience that you just made my day, you're the best. And usually we're like, hey, thanks, Archive, because I'm in a big hurry in support. So instead of that, could we steal this email that I wrote for this presentation that says, hey, that's great to hear, because I'm acting like they just complimented us, right? That's great to hear. We work hard to provide amazing support. Your email is a great testimonial for that. Ooh, did anyone catch what I did there? Which has me thinking, would you mind if we took a sentence or two from your email and used it as a testimonial on our website? We love showing potential users, blah, 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 no pressure if not. That's like the me not being a sales guy, right? The no pressure thing. You can uh, edit to your own accord. Thanks, Rob, in customer support. This Rob guy has a lot of, a lot of roles. He's the founder in customer support. Anyways, steal that text if you want to. Um, auto, you know, put it in the, uh, what are they called, snippets, right? When you're responding to support, boom, it's just a keyword thing. And see what happens. Implementing that in your help desk software will be less than an hour. And then send it out five times next week and just, just see what happens. <clears throat> okay. So everyone, if you've seen me speak before, you know that I have in two intermissions in most of my talks. And that's because I talk fast and I get tired of hearing myself talk for this much and so does everyone else. So this is the first one. They tend to be these short little, you know, kind of hopefully fun videos. Um, this is one of my, I'm not on TikTok, but someone posted this. And this is perhaps my favorite TikTok I've ever seen. And it involves Portland, Oregon, 
and Minneapolis, and how they are so hipster and similar, but not the same. So here we go. Do we have volume on my, on my slides? Awesome. Hello. Are you a liberal hipster who likes to collect tape cassettes or some shit, but you're not so far gone that Portland is a good fit for you? Come join us in Softcore Portland, also known as Minneapolis. Here in Diet Portland, we like vinyl records and ethically sourced coffee, but we're not necessarily full-blown communists. Here in Portland Light, we believe in gay rights, but we also believe that heterosexual relationships are okay too. So I like that because we Portland and Minneapolis are in this like hipster fight of that we have this battle every year of like who has the most bike lanes, right? Most miles of bike lane. And uh, it's funny, everybody from Portland who sees this just cracks up. So, <clears throat> all right. Group two is product. A couple of these are some suggestions from from founders, um, which I was doing. I asked for founders because it's like, yo, I haven't installed like I haven't done a lot of product stuff in six years, so my stuff's a little bit out of date. So a few of these I hope are helpful. Um, the first one, which just caught me totally out of the blue, because I'd never even heard of this. Install microconf, microconf, Microsoft Clarity. I didn't even know what it was. So I Googled it, and it's basically heat mapping, and it is um, like a screen recording. But here's the thing, and I saw the homepage, and I'm like, sweet, so it's a SaaS product? What, what, is, what is the hack here? GDPR and CCPA ready, no sampling, built on open source. And, and this is from Pierre DeWolf of Scraping Bee. Many of you may have seen him on Twitter. So I clicked on pricing to say like, well, if it's just recommending a paid tool, I don't, is that make, is this something I wanna do? And it says Clarity, it's free forever. Enjoy all the features of Clarity, zero cost, will never run into traffic limits, or be forced to upgrade to a paid version. GDPR, CCPA ready, no sampling, built on open source. So I haven't personally tried this, but Pierre swears by it, and I feel like, it would be something I would be trying in less than 60 minutes tomorrow. All right, this was another tip that just had never occurred to me. It's to, if you're on AWS, enable S3 versioning. And what versioning does is all your S3 buckets, you start having versions. So if you go in and delete something, you can get it back. If you go in and modify something, you can get the version back. We know what versioning is, right? The cost is, from what I've heard, absolutely minimal. Um, Benedict Dyka of UserList gave me this tip, and I said, how much cost is it increased? And he said, I don't know, I think our total S3 bill is $5 per month, or maybe euros, and I was like, yeah, it doesn't matter, five euro, $5. So I, I like this idea, and I have heard now, now that I brought it up, I started talking to a few founders, and I had two who told me like, oh yeah, no, I deleted a user like something we store in S3 and I deleted it and we had the version and I got it back. And I was like, that is cheap insurance, man. So I would, I haven't done this, but I'm gonna have to assume you could enable this in like 10 minutes. Or since it's AWS console, like 30 minutes by the time you find it. All right, I hate that console. All right, number 14 is to use uptime monitoring. This is one of the 10 that I'd say 75% of you are already doing. So um, this is also Benedict. And there's a couple cool tools that do this. Uh, Speedway, which is, uh, it's actually a tiny seed company. He doesn't just do like hit an API endpoint or hit an HTTP protocol. He actually has full on protocol bots and browser bots that can see a screen and look for stuff. And it's just a very complicated, uh, not complicated for you, but a, uh, a healthy implementation of what it does. So it can go deeper than just pinging an endpoint and telling you if it's a 200 response. Uh, so speedway.app is one. And then as I mentioned before, Fathom has uptime, fairly simple uptime monitoring built into that. Thanks Derek, I had asked him who he used for uptime and he said uh, Speedway, or uh, Fathom's pretty good. <laughs> Number 15, so we're, going, we're halfway there. Track your knowledge base searches. Track the ones where there are no results returned and log them somewhere. So if someone were to come to your knowledge base and type in shrimp tacos, and they get zero results, we used to, well, it was super hacky because we had access to the source code, it was WordPress, and I went in with my PHP skills, and I uh, hacked thing that like emailed this address, and then we just had them in a label. <clears throat> and then once a week, one of our customer success people would go through that label, and a bunch of it was junk, junk, spam, shrimp tacos, and then he'd come upon several that were like, oh, they're actually searching for something they need to find. And either we don't have an article for it, or we do have an article, but they're not finding it. 
so he would take that phrase and add it as like a tag, or you can just add it as a sentence at the bottom or whatever, and then that would start appearing for the search. So it's just a way to help your users find stuff. If they're gonna, let's be honest, most users, or a lot of users don't go to your KB, and so if they're gonna do it, like let's at least give them, give them a hand. I wouldn't recommend the email approach, it was super hacky, but if you can log it somewhere, um, that's what I would be doing, and then reviewing it weekly, monthly, whatever. Number 16 is the one you really didn't wanna hear. Nobody wants to do this. And it's, it's another email sending one, but it's enabling SPF and DKIM. It's a lot simpler than it sounds. I'm hoping at least half of you, maybe three quarters, uh, already have this. But if you go to DMARC Analyzer, which is this free thing I found on Google, um, I entered my domain, what is that, what would I use, robwalling.com, and it, basically all my stuff sit, sat, except for I have like some capital letters in my SPF record. So this will tell you things aren't there. The hardest part of this is you have to think, okay, I'm sending through SendGrid, and then my ESP, and then maybe we're sending some, well, if we send them through the app, they should be SendGrid. So now you need to go to SendGrid and your ESP, and you need to find their SPF DKIM, because you have to pull some settings from them. So that's the hardest part, is just finding it. Once you find it, you're updating two, I believe it's two DNS records, and I had to do this for a new domain Sherry set up, and it took me, once I had the info, it took me like five minutes, but it took me like 20 minutes to find it. So this is one of those, it's like, do we want our emails to be delivered or not? If you don't care, don't do this, but it, it's definitely the email ecosystem is kind of abusive on these things. Number 17 is to rate limit your APIs. Thanks again to uh, Pierre of Scraping Bee for this one. When he sent it, I said, well, of course, we had rate limiting issues and we implemented it pretty quick. I said, but you can't do this in an hour. Right, that's the whole point, is that the constraint of this talk, because I had about 100 things on a list, but a bunch of them are gonna take you longer than an hour. And he said, aha, au contraire, mon frere. Um, he's French, that was a really bad accent. He said, sorry, Pierre, I apologize. Um, but he's like, all the frameworks, dude, if you're using anything, Flask has Flask limiter, Django has Django rate limit, Rails has Ruby limiter, Laravel has rate limiter, and the best part is he literally just typed that out. Like, boop, top it, like he knew these by heart in the Slack. So um, that's it. Right, let me your APIs. If you have any type of API, someone's gonna DDoS you by accident, is what happens. Um, now I will call out Zapier and Segment, who I still don't know that they honor rate limits and used to DDoS us about once a month by accident because someone would enable it and it would just poof and like crush our servers. But frankly, especially custom integrations, they, will, they should and will um, honor this. All right, number 18, we're getting there. Ask why people are canceling. We took out our in-app ask why people are canceling because people just typed ASDF in our text box and submitted. So what we did that I found slightly better results, your mileage may vary, easy enough to test, right? Um, I think you could test this in under an hour, I'll put it that way, you hide your the, the text box and you put this into an automated email that goes out. Is we had an email that went out, I think it was like 12, 10 minutes, 12 minutes after someone canceled Rob's back to being a founder here. Hey, I noticed you canceled your product name account. As we continue to improve, it would be super helpful if you could hit reply, let me know why you decided, even if it's just a few words, thanks. I'm the founder, that was the appeal. And we didn't get 100% replies for sure, but the replies we did get might be one sentence. I decided this, I moved to MailChimp because X, Y, Z. Um, you know, your UX isn't what I want, but it, we at least got some helpful feedback there. Moving on to the next one. This one is probably the least it is, it's the least SaaS specific. It's more like these are some of my own personal productivity hacks or things I'll just throw out. I think there's like five of them, but we should go through them quick. Um, number 19 is to use my text expander. So I have three text expanders that I use daily and they are my address, my ADD, my ad for my address, my Cal, which is my Savvy Cal link, and my Zoom, which is my private Zoom room link. And I put those, I use the Apple ecosystem. I'm sure Android has the same thing, but like in Apple, it's like you go to settings, you go to keyboard and you just type these things and you copy them in and then you're done. And now on any Apple device, cause I have two iPads and a computer and I have my phone, it's all the same. And I, all the time I'm typing an email on my phone and I'm like, Ugh, okay, hey, yeah, let's just connect. Uh, use this link, my cow, and it's like poof, and it expands, and it's like magic, right? I know some people who are amazing with this and have like 50 expanders. I'm not smart enough to remember that many. So I really rely on these three, and then you'll see my no pitch, which is no thanks, we don't take 
guest pitches on our podcast, please remove me from your list. That's what that one is. But, but the my ad, my cow, and my Zoom, uh, I've come to, uh, to really like and enjoy. Number 20 is an email processing hack I have, which is have an email label for lower priority tasks. So anything that comes in that isn't someone on my team is not waiting on me, or I know that I can wait a week, two weeks. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff, right? Where it's like, well, I'm gonna file that thing with the IRS in two and a half weeks. Um, I need to respond to this thing, but it's, it's next month or whatever, but I know I don't wanna lose it. I label it in Google, in Gmail. And I have it called underscore this week because underscore moves it to the top. You can pick whatever label you want, but I go underscore this week, boom, it's out of my inbox. And I get to inbox zero that way. And then once a week from nine to 10 a.m. on one particular day, and I'm not gonna say the day because if all the emails you get from me are on that day, then you know that I'm this weeking your email. But from nine to 10 a.m., I sit down and I go through all of the this weeks and I have the, there's one in the business account, one in my personal account. And I've never had a week where I haven't gotten through all of them. There's usually not that many. I will actually email, like Jason Cohen wrote a cool article last week and it's like, I don't have time to read this, like 3,000 words, so I threw it into this week. And there was a, there was a YouTube video I wanted to watch, um, some Rand Fishkin stuff he said. Like there are certain things that I wanna consume as well. Now I don't go crazy with it, I do filter, because you can throw in three hours worth of content into this, you don't do that, right? But you throw in things that need to be responded to or that you really want to, uh, to consume and, and think about. And then I don't worry about that stuff at all until I get there. All right, number 21 is to upgrade to the Audible annual plan if you're an Audible listener. I think we have close to 680 books in our Audible account between the family. And so we buy a lot of books. And frankly, the monthly plan, your books are $11.50 a piece. And on the annual plan, they're like $9 and something. And that will save you money that you can use to grow your startup. You're welcome. So <laughs> that, was, that was maybe the lamest tip in the whole thing, I promise. I, you know, if you don't use Audible, it was just a whiff. But um, number 22 is to consider asynchronous voice. So there are a lot of meetings that should not be meetings, but they also shouldn't be Slack threads. And having a three minute or a five minute voice text in essence can be super helpful. And there are ways to do this. We, I used to use Loom or a screencast to just record my screen of some emptiness and then send it to someone. The beauty of Loom is, or an equivalent is that you can say 1.7x this person because two, two X, right? Even I talk fast, but you can still two X me and, and hear it. And it's, so even if I do like an eight minute review of something, you can do it quick. There's this other tool that I've used and still use actually, my team hates it, but you know, it's, it's, it's my favorite. It's called Voxer and it's, um, it's fine, it's free. And it's a little, only a tiny bit buggy, but you can do it from your phone or your desktop uh, browser. And basically I can ping up, uh, like here's a great example of a great use case for this is when we're doing interviews um, for some new roles that we're hiring for, I am a second interview a lot, right? Xander's a first interview for an event producer and then I do the second interview. So I interviewed someone and I have a bunch of thoughts for Xander. He's in the middle of stuff. We shouldn't. I don't think we should schedule a meeting because I basically have five minutes of just me saying, here's some nuance of how I think, here's the pros and cons of this person, here's you know, uh, yellow flags and some things I think you know, she did really well. So boop, I touch the button, it's push to talk on Voxer, it notifies Xander and it sends the audio and then any time later, right, he gets a notification like a text but he can pull it up and he can just be like, oh, I'm three Xing Rob on this because this guy talks forever, ding. And then he can listen to my thoughts and he can respond via voice most people on my team respond via Slack, which is fine too. Um, but it's, it has changed, it has reduced the number of meetings and long ass emails I have to send. Because if I'm gonna send an email to Xander summarizing all the things I think about this candidate, it's five minutes of audio. You know how many words is that that I'd be typing out? It's way more efficient for me to, to talk it. And the last one I think in this category, this may be my favorite of the whole thing. People may laugh. I cannot watch online video at 1x anymore. I can't watch almost any video. So every browser I'm in, I have a plugin. Uh, and I, this is the Chrome one, it's called Video Speed Controller. It has two, more than two million users and 3,100 4.8 star reviews. It's incredible. Every video in your browser on Chrome uh, will have, now you can see the little um, controls. And you can do like, I believe it's like shift D to make it faster, shift S, or you can use your mouse. Maybe it's command D. You know how when you remember, yeah, I memorize the thing, but I don't remember what the, the, the actual keys are. And so you'll see 
the like best one of the best bootstrapping talks of all time by Jason Cohen here. I have this control up there, and so I I, I rewatch this talk like every year or two, but I watch it at about two x, and it just lets me zip through, uh, zip through. I will never. When I get on my kids' computers, I'm like, no, guys, you have to install this because I can't sit here. I can't even. I know YouTube now. YouTube has speed control, which is cool, and Netflix does too. I think it's only up to 1.5x, um, but most of the other platforms don't. So this has saved me hundreds of hours of time since I started using it. Okay. Intermission 2. This is from Fast Company, and it's something about reading between the lines in meetings. play devil's advocate here, but allow me to be a dick for a second, but with no consequences. Let's pull back on that for a second. I fell asleep while you were talking and I have no idea what's happening. Huh? I've got a stupid question. It's actually like a really smart question, but I was wondering if I say stupid beforehand, does that make me like kind of modest? Is that like sort of charming thing to do, right? Let's pick that up in the next meeting. I need a few days to figure out what the hell you're talking about. But will this scale? One of the managing directors once used that phrase in a meeting, so now I use it all the time. Sorry, this is just a work email I have to answer. I'm actually playing words with friends with everyone else in this meeting but you. Um, do you know a four-letter word for long-winded? If there is an outside chance, you might be right. You're wrong. <laughs> you're definitely wrong. I think what you're trying to say is, so what I'm gonna do is take that idea and then make it sound like it was mine. Let's try to make this viral, okay? I just heard about this site called reddit.com. Can we get on there? I think we should make this a cross-platform opportunity. I watch Shark Tank. Let's take this offline. Yeah, can we pick this up again? Um, just maybe 15 minutes after uh, never again. All right, so thanks, Fast Company. All right, we're getting there. So this is the last section. This is on internal operations. Um, Number 24 of 31 is to use team password management. Hopefully you're doing this already, but um, we didn't. Uh, I, frankly, I had never really seen team password management until we got acquired in 2016, and then I was like, oh, I totally get this. So LastPass has LastPass teams, 1Password has 1Password teams. From day one, when we like formed TinySeed, I said everything's going into a business uh, team's password management account. And what it does is if people, like let's say you settle on LastPass teams, any of your employees who has a um, LastPass personal account can link it so that in their browser they can see both, but the company can't see their personal stuff. And then when they leave, you just unlink it so you retain your passwords. You can, there's also a shared folder where you can just dump a bunch of passwords in and everybody can access it in their browser. So it's a relatively simple tip. If you're already doing it, you know this is a no-brainer. If you're not doing it, it's, it's, you gotta, like, it, we just, you can't have the password sitting around in text files and wherever else you have them. Um, this is a super simple one that I saw at lead pages when we got acquired. Use an email alias for SAS, for every SAS account you sign up for. And it was like, there was like accounts at leadpages.net or whatever. Um, and that's usually what it is. If you haven't done that already, it's, it is not impossible, but it is a challenge to go back and change them all. So if you haven't done that already, I'd make a, you make this a group, right, where it's like my co-founders plus maybe an ops person or whoever you have on your team, like it's two or three people, get that email. So if there needs to be a password reset and you're on vacation, which is what used to happen because all a bunch of crap was set up under rob at getdrip.com and I'd be in Mexico and like on the beach and it's like, you have the login, dude, and we can't do it. This keeps that from happening, from you being a single point of failure. Um, so relatively simple hack. This one is super fascinating because I've never heard anyone say this and it's a suggestion from a founder. Use privacy.com for spending management. So this is Rahul from Nestify. And basically, privacy.com, you can generate these credit card numbers. And so you generate a credit card, a virtual payment card is what they call it. And you can say, it's a one-time purchase and only up to $20. And then you enter that in a, in a store. You can say, it's a recurring purchase, max $20, reject anything. Generate another one and... Um, you give it, put it in Netflix, or you put it in GitHub, maybe is a better example, and it locks itself to GitHub, and if anyone else got that number, no one else can charge it but GitHub. 
So it's just a, it's an abstraction layer <laughs> of your actual credit card number. I don't know. I mean, my personal number is stolen at, at least every 18 months. I have to redo all my subscriptions. I'm thinking about doing this for me personally, but um, Rahul was swearing by it as something for the business. So I think it's kind of an interesting one. Hard to go back and do, but it's again, it's one of those things moving forward. Is this something that we think about? Also, it helps you if you want to put a, you can pause, you can unpause, you can put limits so that, such that you don't have to track everything and it can just get rejected when you don't want that to be charged anymore. 27 is to keep a manual updates list. And what I mean by this is there are certain things on your websites that you just can't code. So an example of this is that number right there, 590. I can't write code to populate that number because it's not the number of posts we have in the Startups for the Rest of Us site. It's hard coded in the WordPress. So I can't just do a count on the column or a whatever because there's a bunch we exclude and it's not in the column why we exclude, you know, that kind of thing. So it's literally, we're, it's just a number and it's embedded in there. And this is a tiny seat about page. It says, we've backed more than 60 fast growing SaaS companies across four continents. That's just the number, and guess what? In a month, we'll be at like 84. So are we gonna remember to come back and edit this? No. And so it's gonna sit there for 60 for like eight months, and then someone's gonna mention it to us, because we never read our own websites, right? So what I did like two months ago was I created another uh, Google Sheet, and I say, I called it things that need periodic updating, and I have a recurring quarterly calendar reminder. All it says is check things that need updating. And I come in here, and I zip through them, I click, 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 and you can see it's just a location and a, and a what that, I, that should be updated. And I actually just updated Startup for the Rest of Us. I think it was at like 560 or something. And I was like, yes, system's working. 28, similar to this, is add a quarterly calendar reminder or maybe a, a monthly one to review credit card transactions. If you don't go through your business transactions at least once a quarter, put an hour on that calendar. You can do, it a, month, uh, you can do a quarter in less than an hour. And if you don't put it on the calendar, you just don't do it, or at least I don't. 29 is to push live chat and email support into Slack. I had not actually, I bet, I bet several of you are doing this, but this is a, a suggestion by Andy Cabasso of Postaga. And um, I thought it was a pretty cool one. He was talking about like Chatleo. You can do live chat on your website directly in Slack. Intercom integrates directly in Slack. Uh, Help Scout has a Slack integration. Even Stripe events, he's pumping in like refunds and trials churn, like all kinds of stuff. And I asked him why he does this. And he said, because now like Stripe, it, I'm sorry, Slack is our hub of our business. Um, and I don't wanna be switching in and out of a bunch of apps. And I'm already talking to my coworkers in Slack. So why not have it ping up and you know, do a DM-ish thing to me if I'm on call for support that now I just chat, I'm chatting with a customer. They're just an anonymous you know, ex user. So that's a fun one. Last two. 30 is to send a monthly advisor email. And this was one I recommend to people anyways, but uh, this is one that specifically I remember Mark Tobias in that original talk of his 50 of open cage data, that was in the talk. And I just give you a sample format. Again, it'll be in a PDF. This is what we give to tiny seed companies. What this does, and I, there are several totally bootstrap founders in this room who do this already, and I'm on some of their lists. Um, and I get uh, around 100-ish of these a month, both from Tiny Seed and not Tiny Seed. I read every one. I don't respond to all of them, but I read every one. What this gives you is a lot of our bootstrapping, we don't have the rigor <laughs> necessarily. You don't want to, you don't want the rigor of a VC-backed company. You don't want a board. You don't want, but seriously, to sit down for 20 minutes a month and to write something that talks about wins, of the last month, losses, plans, problems, and has just the metrics for the last two months. And you pick some people at MicroConf, pick people in your mastermind, pick uh, you know an advisor, ask me if I wanna get it, just send it. And if you get into that discipline, you'll often find that problems section at the bottom will uh, generate an intro, right? Or it'll generate some feedback of like, oh, I already know how to fix that, so you should think about it. So I think it's an interesting one. The last one is, one that I thought about including, well, I almost had 30, and uh, I really wanted to include this one because I think this gets beyond the tactical nature of a lot of these, and it digs into like team culture and company culture. And it's something that I have done, I would say naturally, and I'm not sure why, but I've seen a lot of people not do this. And so we have, we had some traditions at Drip, and we now have traditions we've just kind of accidentally done at Tiny Seed that are actually, they make us feel like we're, they make us know that we belong. 
because we get, we understand these and they have a lot, they start to have a lot of meaning over time. So our tradition back in the drip days was to troll each other. This is way early pre-acquisition. I think it was like four of us on the team. Derek's the only one missing. So in this one, we are trolling Derek because he's at home and we're eat, drinking wine and hanging out at Bitwise in Fresno. This one, we're also trolling Derek with cupcakes and it just starts spontaneously happening. And then this one, Derek's now in the picture, my kids are there, and it, Derek's wife and Zach, and we're trolling Ian and Anna, who were in the other one, right? So this just became a thing, and I just stumbled upon these, and then this is Derek and Ian now, I think, trolling Anna, because uh, we're eating sushi and she's not. So this became kind of a fun thing that we would do, and there's, there's a lot of these photos. And then what I realized is, I was like, wow, what do we have for, for Tiny Seed? And I realized that when we did a, a headshot, this is our about page, uh, that Anar was gone, he had to fly out to see his family, and so we pulled him up, pick up on my iPad, and we just kind of pointed to Anar and said, ah, isn't it funny, he's missing. And then a couple months later, we're in California and Xander's not there. And so now it's Tracy, Anar, and I mocking Xander. So that, that's our, I think, gonna be our, our uh, tradition. But I will say the one that I think, that I still, Derek and I still text about, and I honestly get a little choked up about it because it is, uh, has such deep meaning for me, is there's this stuff called fire cider and it's um, habanero infused, Apple cider, vinegar, wellness tonic, firesider.com, or you can buy it on Amazon. We got in a little sna monthly snack subscription, and some of the snacks weren't great, but there was this little fire cider thing, and I was like, I don't know, let's all try it out. So we all took a little sip, and we're like, oh my God, this is, this is awful. It's not alcoholic, but it just, it lights you up. And so we were joking a little bit, and, and the fire cider just sat there for like a month, and then I said, all right, folks, at some point, you realize that this is launch juice, and anytime we launch a big feature, we're all doing a shot. And instantly, everyone's like, hell yes. This is a challenge. So I bought the Firesider shot glasses, and uh, on the Firesider shot glass they make, it's like, there's different levels, and it's like, re repel vampires, um, you know, clean out your innards, and blah, blah, blah. So we'd line it up, and we'd hit ship it, boom, and we'd all take a, a shot. It was great. And so, by the time I was leaving Drip, when we had, because that was when we had two engineers, by the time I was leaving Drip, no joke, I was buying it by the gallon. <laughs> and on the, your first day as an engineer on the product, it was the product and engineering team, we would say, hey, here you are, here's a shirt, here's a sticker, and here's your shot glass. And people were like, what is this, what is happening? And we always had to say, it's not alcoholic. Like, it's not, but it became a thing that I believe still happens today. Um, because when I left, my, my su successor said, where do I get the fire cider? Because I want, you know, I want to keep this going because it became such a cool thing. So anyways, that is all for me today.